All right, we're going to talk a little bit about lambda calculus, which is our functional approach to truth conditional semantics, as well as some types. So we might think back to our different theory that we talked about for F1 and F2, which is model theory earlier in this lecture series. And with model theory, we're basically saying like, in a set where something happens, do we have a member that's in that set for that sentence to be true? In the functional approach, what we're doing is a little bit different. We're considering, let's say, a bunch of individuals in our domain, and we're going to ask, say, a question about an intransitive verb. So something like, who snores? And it's going to send it off to either something being true or false. So in our domain, we're going to have a bunch of individuals. Let's say Steve is here. Let's say Mark is here. Let's say Sue is here. And then for each of those individuals, it's either going to be true or it's going to be false. So what we could do in this case is take the verb snores, uh, which would be our function here. We could put Sue in there. And then in this case, it'd say that, no, it's false. So. The, fa the sentence Sue snores is false because Sue is not mapping to one in this case. So uh, this is what the functional approach is all about. Things get more complicated, but that's just a basic reason for why we think about it in the first place. And one important thing here is with this verb phrase, loves John. So the question is, at this point, what are we looking for still to make this a complete sentence? Well. What we're looking for is a subject in this case. And uh, so if we were to translate just the VP at this point, we had loves, we know J is the object, but we're looking for some subject here. Now, if the subject is a proper name, which is what we typically expect, then we could put a constant in there for like Mary or something. If it was like, say, a quantified noun like, everybody loves John, and we'd say for all X, X loves John. So that could be how we translate it. But at this point, we don't actually know what we're looking for in terms of what the subject will look like. We just know that we need something to fill in this position. So we can put X in there, and we introduce this new notation, lambda X in this case. So this is like acting like a function in a way. It's going to take in some sort of entity, it's going to take in a subject, it's going to put the subject into the predicate, and uh, if that subject with that um, object is mapping to true, then the sentence will be true. So let's say that we have this function here, I'm just going to put it in this sort of notation, and then we apply very to it. What this is going to do in this case is this is going to replace every instance of x with Mary, and then because we have a function here, this is either going to be true or this is going to be false. So this will let us put our subjects and objects in individually, and the translation in lambda calculus is more something for a different video, just to give you some uh, insights into what we're doing, what this will look like, and understanding types going forward. So uh, types are important distinctions for semanticists. So we use the type E to mean individuals. So you can think of these as like elements of a domain or just people's names in this case. So you might think of it as John, Mary, Sue, so-and-so, uh, the same names that every linguist uses. The type T is going to be our truth values. So whether it's going to be zero or one, I guess we just have two options here. T will always be one of those things. So now we have types E and T. That's all we're going to use right now. But if we have two types, so let's call them sigma and tau. We don't care what they are. Then what we can do is we can say that the pair sigma tau is a type as well. And this is going to be a function. So we have type E, we have type T. This means that we can take uh, ET as a type. And what this is going to be doing is this is going to take a, this is going to be a function that puts in an entity 
and then it gives you out a truth value. So I shouldn't really put an arrow there. I should really put like an equal sign. So um, these are just categories. So what this means is an application, we would be putting in a name and then we'd be getting a truth value. So I like one or zero in this case. So another way of writing this is by saying it's a function from, we call DE, so the domain of entities to the domain of types. So in other words, it's gonna take a name and it's gonna pop out a truth value. The D just means the domain or the codomain in this case. So basically what our sets are. Okay, so these are types. Now let's think intuitively about some syntactic categories and their types. So I'll just draw a little tree. I'm not gonna put in any of the uh, little words that we could use to make a sentence. But okay, so we have, in this case, a transitive verb and a verb phrase, and now we have two proper names for our nouns. So if we think about the types of these things, what do we get at S? We get a full sentence. So we can evaluate sentences as true or false. This means that S should be of type T. So I'm just gonna put that in there. And let's think about proper names. So someone like Mary. Well, that's a person in a world. So this should be type E. This should be an entity. So I'm just gonna put a little E right there and move on. What about in the case of a VP? So a VP is still missing a subject. So what it's going to want to do in this case is it's going to want to take the noun phrase, figure it out with the function VP itself, and then output a truth value. So what I can do is I can say it's going to find a subject and in this case, we, we know what the type of the NP is in this case, but we'll leave that for just a second. And then we're gonna output a truth value. So this is what the VP is going to do. So what this means is if we think about types as a relationship between input and output, we're going to want to take something, the subject, we're gonna to wanna to spit out a truth value. Now, what is the type of this subject? Well, it's sort of just like a pass-up rule in semantics uh, when we looked at model theory. So whatever the type of a single daughter is, the parent will get that same type. So uh, we know that the subject in this case is going to just be an entity. And hopefully for all NPs, we can just keep them as E's, but we'll see if that changes. Okay, so this means that the VP itself is of type ET. Now, what you may notice is if you take a look at this tree, we have an E, we're using E as an input, and we're getting T out of the top. This is something you'll see pretty often because this is how the rules are applied. So for example, you can kind of uh, extract from this bit that the VT and the NP nodes, what we're going to get is basically something that gives us an ET as an output, which would be the VP here. And then we're gonna get whatever that same type is as the other thing. So that way uh, these two happen to match and we can get ET coming out of the VP. Okay, so that's just a little aside, but with the VT, what do we think? Well, the VT is interesting. So this is our transitive verb. If you're at the VT node, so let me just circle all the ones that we actually did intuitively. If we're at the VT node, there's two things we need to do. We need to find an object, and then the transitive verb is gonna do something else. After it finds an object, it does need to find a subject. And what it's going to do after that is it's going to output a truth value at the S node. So what we need to do is we need to find basically two noun phrases. So we need to take two entities. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna take an object, E, then we're gonna do another function here that's gonna take a subject, 
and then pop out a truth value. So our transitive verbs will be of type E-E-T. And what this means is even if we just take a look at our other things afterwards, what we're going to get are two E's coming together. E is our input, and we're going to get E-T as our output, and the tree is going to resolve pretty nicely. So some of these types are very intuitive. Some of these are not. Uh, this is not the easiest thing to grasp the first time you're, you're doing it. But transitive verbs and verb phrases are a nice thing to look at because we can see what we're looking for in a sentence to make it complete. And the verb, the predicate, is basically the truth value for the sentence. So we can build up from the verb into the sentence node quite nicely. So we do have a problem. And our problem is that when we just did the transitive verb, we said it was type E-E-T. So E going to E-T. Now, you might have wondered, like, why didn't I just do E to E and then do a T afterwards? Well, in this case, we're not getting the right matches to do our um, application with types. So that's the technical reason why. But in terms of what's happening here, we need to think about the order that things are being acquired from first to last. So first, what we're doing is we're getting an object, then we're getting a subject, and then we're going to get a truth value out of it. And when you're doing these functions, we want to be doing them right to left to account for the order that things are happening. So first, we're finding an object, and then we're going in, and then we're doing the subject to truth value. So right to left just fits the syntax a little bit nicer. So let's say we have a verb like loves. And we know how to write loves in predicate logic. It is loves and it takes a pair of things. So we could say x, y in this case. Now, the thing with the predicate notation is that it doesn't really account for the order in which we're acquiring the object and the subject. The other problem is this is a pair of things and what we really want to have are two individual elements. So maybe something like loves x, y, where then we can apply uh, two different things to our function here. So we go through this thing called currying. Now what this is going to do is this is going to turn a single function that takes pairs into two separate functions that each take an individual element. So I'd like to draw this out. Now, what we know is that in syntax and in our semantics, we grab the object first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the elements that are the second part of a pair here. So we're going to have uh, J, we're going to have S, and we're going to have M. And each of these are going to be their own functions that take a look the possible different subjects we could have here. So if J is the object, we could have J as the subject or S or M as the subject. If S is the object, we could have J, S or M. And if M is the object, we could have all of these as well. And in this case, these will be their own functions that now have to find truth values. So this is basically what our new function is going to look like. What it does is it takes an entity, it takes another entity, and it's going to spit out a truth value. We can see that this matches uh, quite nicely with our type notation here, which is what we were looking for. So because we're doing object, then subject, I will label these so that way we know how we're getting these values. So for the first one, if we do for j to j to what, what is our solution going to be? Well, first we need to take a look at our subject, or sorry, our object j first, find the subject coming second, see it's a one, so this is going to output a one. What if we do j to s to what? Well, again, we're taking a look at our object first, then we're taking a look at our subject. So the pair s j originally is now going to be from j to s to truth value, which in this case is also one. So this is because we pick up the object first. So we do the object first in our function, then the subject. So now if we take a look at J to M, this will be in our pair MJ. So J is the object. Now we take a look at M. This outputs a one. So this will also be a one. 
we can do each of these other ones pretty quickly. So S to J is going to be the pair JS, that gives us 1. S to S is going to be the pair SS, which gives us 0. Uh, S to M is going to be the pair MS, which also gives us 0. And for M, we just need to take a look at the three remaining ones. So the pair JM is 0, which means M to J is 0. We're going to get M to M is 1. And we're going to get M to S is 0. So that came from these three lines here. So now, uh, this is our curried function. And this is going to allow us now uh, to search for our subjects and objects in our sentence and have a functional approach that doesn't have pairs. So it's all binary. We can apply these to trees and we can do compositional semantics with them. That's next video. What I do want you to think about is something like the sentence Carrie likes Fred or likes CF. This is a pair of two things. So there's two things we want to be able to do. We want to rewrite this translation where our function is curried. So we don't just have a pair here. And when we take a look at our trees, we know that the object comes first. So what this is going to look like in this case is our predicate likes. We're going to put our object first and we're going to put our subject after. So we can now try tr translate this as likes F C. So first we're getting our object, then we're getting our subject. So let's say we took this function and we applied say Mary to it. Um, I guess we can't really do that because it's not a function. It's just F and C in this case. This is a full sentence. But in lambda notation, we can definitely do this. So what we can do is say that we have a predicate likes. It is a function that takes a look at Y and X. So the object is first, the subject is second. And then what we can do is we can uh, write out lambda notation for this. So we can say lambda x, lambda y, which means we don't know what our x and y's are. We're going to hunt for them. Um, when we put in our function, it's going to take the object first, and then it's going to take the subject after. So we can see this in lambda notation in the next video. We can take a look at how we do these with trees. What I should mention is that typically uh, when we do uh, get to a stage like this, um, what we're doing instead is uh, taking it with predicates still. So this would be still lambda x, lambda y, likes x, y. But what these lambdas are going to do, and I should actually reverse the order of this because again, we have our object coming first, and our subject coming second. When we apply things to this, Essentially, what's going to happen is whatever our first entry is to our function, let's say it's Mary, it's going to replace all of the X's. So we could get something then like lambda Y, and then we're going to get likes uh, Y, but we know who X is in this case, it's Mary, and then we can do one more abstraction by taking another input. So. Uh, that was a quick introduction, mainly to types, um, but just to take a look at exactly what's happening in terms of our logic. And uh, hopefully if you have any questions, I can answer them down below. And thank you for commenting, subscribing, all that other fun stuff. And I hope to see you in the next one.